Okay, so now we're going to look at the fixed fixed column. So same setup as before. This time you notice in the schematic of the column here, we can see up at point B, we have a support arrangement that allows the column to deflect vertically. Okay, so to get shorter as a column would, but it's stopping the column from rotating. Okay, so it's the same as the support at point A, except it allows for vertical movement at the top of the column. We again have our deflected shape or our buckled shape on the in the middle diagram. And then again, making a cut up at some position X along the column, we have uh, revealed an internal bending moment and an internal axial force. And that's our free body diagram. Exactly same procedure as before. Uh, and in fact, we're going to abbreviate this uh, derivation somewhat because it is so similar to what we've looked at before. So the first thing we want to do is determine an expression for the internal bending moment in the column. And so in order to do that, I will take the sum of the moments about the cut. I know that must equal zero. And so in doing that, I have mx, uh, let me see, minus ma plus p times v must equal zero. And so that means that mx must equal ma minus pv. Well, that's, uh, that looks like a subscript, it's not. That's p times v. Okay, so again, we sub this straight into our differential equation. And we end up with, let me see, ei times v prime prime, second derivative of v, and that's equal to m subscript a minus p times v, okay? And we can rearrange, and again, using the same substitution for k that we had in our previous derivation, and that equation, it's the same equation, but it's a little bit easier to look at, and it is v prime prime plus k squared, that's for our substitution, times v is equal to m a, over E I. Go ahead and call that equation 16. So this is the governing differential equation for a fixed fixed column. Now the process follows exactly the same procedure as before. We have a general solution that's made up of a complementary solution, which we saw on our very first derivation for the pin pin column, and a particular solution. And again, following the exact same procedure, you can work that out fairly straightforwardly, fairly easily. So I'm just gonna state the solutions here. Uh, and we saw that when we looked at our pin pin column and then our particular solution, m subscript a over p. And again, I would just say or suggest to you to confirm, confirm that yourself following the procedure, exact same procedure, very straightforward, that we used in our previous derivation. And so with that, we can state the general solution. So again, we want to use our boundary conditions here. And so the boundary conditions in this case are reasonably straightforward to reason out. The lateral deflection at x equal to zero at the base of the column is going to be zero. The rotation at the base of the column, so that's v prime for the first differential, the base of the column x equal to zero is equal to zero because it's a fixed support. And the deflection at the top of the column, unlike the free, the column that was fixed free, in this case, the, the deflection at the top of the column is not delta, but is zero. And so we sub these three boundary conditions back into this equation. And again, I'm gonna suggest for a bit of practice, a bit of exercise, you do that yourself. But when you do that, you end up with the equation for the critical buckling load, PCR, and also an equation for the lateral deflection, V, as a function of X, and I'll state those now. So the task really for you is to use those three equations, or rather those three boundary conditions, back into that equation to arrive here. So PCR. And those are true for N equal to one, two and three. So if we use those equations to look a little bit closer at our fundamental buckling mode, our first mode of buckling. Okay, so this is the deflected shape of our column. The corresponding critical load that would induce that deflected or buckling shape is four pi squared EI over L squared. And the equation that gave us that deflected shape is equal to. Okay, now the thing to note here is we've got these inflection points here 
and here. So you'll recall from our previous discussion of effective length for any column, uh, for any set of end conditions, the effective length for that column, the effective length is equal to the, the length of the equivalent pinned end column. And we saw that for a fixed free column, we had to extend the deflected shape until we reached two, until we reached rather a second inflection point. And so the effective length of a, of a fixed free column was in fact two times the length of the original column. Well, in this case, it's the opposite. In this case, in order for me to get uh, an essentially an equivalent uh, pinned pinned column, this is my equivalent pinned pinned column. So it's the distance between inflection points. And in this case, it's L over two. So I can write a little side note here that LE, the effective length for a fixed fixed column is in fact half the length of the column. Okay, so that more or less wraps up our discussion of the fixed fixed column.